Our youth pastor is coming to bring us the word. This is Joseph Pilgrim. He and Amber serve this congregation in so many areas, two of which are youth ministry and the tech ministry. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for the opportunity we get to have to be in your presence. God, we thank you for the team that led us into, the, into your presence with the Holy Spirit already in this room. Holy Spirit, come and be in these words that I speak. I pray that you would use them to pierce the hearts of the people. And anything that is not of you, Father, may it fall to the floor. May we be challenged in our faith, in our beliefs after today, Father. And may we go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going to ask you a quick question. Is the Bible accurate? Man, it's like I'm in youth ministry. Y'all are like interacting. This is great. So for some of us in this room, we're not sure about this question. We have doubts or we have been told things in our life that maybe maybe make us question the legitimacy of the Bible. And for others, we're like, hands down, like this is, there is no doubt. Okay, this is God's word. It's from God. And it is for my life. But for those who question this, I just want to challenge your thinking for just a little bit. And for those who believe that the Bible is accurate, I want to give you some tools to help lead your life a little bit more to just give you a little bit more confirmation that the Bible is the word of God. Everybody say amen. amen. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And while we turn there, I just want to kind of ask some of those questions that may be brought up when people question the legitimacy of the Bible. This is a book. It's a mystery to some and life for others. They may say things to question it like, it's an old and outdated book. You may have heard this. They'll say it was written by man. Or they'll even say things like, it doesn't relate to people today. So my first question was, is the Bible accurate? And we're gonna answer that with a few more questions today along the way. But before we do that, let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. If you got it, say word. word. Let's try that again. If you got it, say word. word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That's a lot to take in in just that verse. But let's start with the first word. It says all. All. Didn't say some. It didn't say most. Didn't say the majority. It said all. Verse 17 says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Everybody say equipped. equipped. But all scripture is breathed out by God. And profitable for teaching what we're doing now, teaching. Reproof for correction. That's a tough one. We don't like being corrected in our way of thinking or even in our way of life. And training in righteousness. It's used for all these things so that man, the men of God, the women of God, the people of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So let me ask you real quick. What is the Bible? The word. Let's unpack it a little bit though. The Bible itself is a collection of 66 books. It was written by 40 different authors, about 40 authors. They may think it's more or less. They're not quite 100% sure, but that they think it's about 40. It was written over a 1,500-year time period. 
in three different continents, in three different languages. So all of these things are in the book, the one book that you hold in your hand or in your cellular device. Yet there is one major theme throughout the entirety of this book. That major theme is God's love for mankind through the redemption and salvation of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. So through all of these books, through all these different authors over a 1500 year time period, in three different continents, three different languages, you have this one overarching theme. So let's talk about the four major themes or four major points of the Bible. Those four major themes are going to be creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Okay? If you read the Bible in its entirety, you will see all four of these themes. So let's talk about them a little bit. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. That's chapters one and two. Chapter one is kind of a overarching summary of what happens in creation. Chapter two is a more detailed extent. Okay? And in the third chapter of the very first book, we hit the fall. And Miss Mack last week talked about Uh, stories where the main character, if nothing ever happens to him, it's really boring, right? We being God's creation, God's major point of the story, his people, if something didn't happen, it'd be a really boring book, wouldn't it? But needless to say, God gives us grace. You see, mankind decides that they're gonna be God themselves and take knowledge of good and evil into their own hands. So at the fall, we don't, don't only see that sin, but we see the sin of blame shifting, trying to push it off and like make it not as big of a deal as it was. There's more than just eating of the tree. And that's where man starts to fall. And what we see later on is God try to use imperfect people throughout the Old Testament uses people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Joseph, even though Joseph wasn't originally a patriarch, you could still see God moving in Joseph's life. He he calls prophets, major and minor prophets, to speak God's word to the nation of Israel. And yet, each time, Men fail. You would think God would be like, all right, look, let's try this again. He did once. And he chose Noah to try and make it right. And even Noah was just like, sorry, God, I messed that up too. But here's the thing. After all the prophets, we have this 400-year time period where God is silent. I was silent for four seconds and some of you got nervous. But could you imagine God not speaking for 400 years? Could you go back 400 years from now and think about what time period that was? What was going on at that time? The United States didn't exist. 400 years, God was silent. And the redemption story starts with the life of Jesus. You see, Jesus walks this perfect life being the perfect example of how we're supposed to live. He walks the earth 30 years, approximately, give or take, and starts his ministry. And here's the thing. Jesus lived his life so that we could be in relationship with God. He took our place on a cross and died a death that we deserve. 
And this is where the restoration part of the Bible starts. You see, after Jesus rose from the grave, he walked with his followers for 40 days and transcended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And he acts as a gateway for us to be able to have relationship with God. You see, Jesus could only exist in one spot. And so when he left, he gave us a gift of the Holy Spirit so that we could experience God without Jesus having to be literally right next to us. The restoration of people happens when we accept Jesus as our Savior and we receive the Holy Spirit, who is the one who transforms our life. And the Bible provides us examples of how we can achieve this. Real quick, let me tell you what the Bible is not. The Bible is not a science book. It's not an astronomy book or an anatomy book. It's not a get-rich-quick plan. And it doesn't give you answers for every minor decision in life. Notice I said minor. Meaning it's not going to tell you what you're going to eat for lunch after today. But it does give us a way to live. It does give us purpose. It gives us a plan for our life. It gives us ways to hear from God. The Bible is a love letter from God telling us how we can have relationship with him. Question number two is, what does the Bible say about itself? So let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17 again. I think I've kind of hit on this already. <clears throat> there are some translations that say Scripture is God-inspired. And while that is true, I believe that the ESV translation says it best, where all Scripture is breathed out. Everybody say breathed. breathed. You see, the authors themselves were not inspired I'll say that again. The authors themselves were not inspired, but the words that God put in the writer's hearts were inspired by God. The best way that I can think of this is the words were dictated to them as God spoke to each one of them individually. God breathed and spoke to these writers and they were inspired to write what God said so that others could experience and be equipped for whatever life brings their way. So let me ask you real quick, what is the process for getting the Bible and how do we get it? <clears throat> well, let's turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 to 21. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 says, for we did not clever, did not follow cleverly devised myths when we uh, made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitness of his majesty. For when, we, when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard the very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's focus in on those last two verses. It says that knowing that, first of all, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit 
The word spirit right there in Hebrew is the word ruach. Everybody say ruach. ruach. This word can be translated as breath, wind, or spirit. Like the wind moves a ship with sails, God carried the author's mind, hands, and moved their hearts to write what we now call the Bible. Third question I have for you guys. What proof do we have about the truthfulness of the Bible? I'm going to break this down into three more points. But we're going to look at these things to solidify the accuracy of the Bible. We're going to look at discovery, chronology, and prophecy. Let's start with the first one. Let's start with discovery. And what we're going to talk about here is what we have discovered along the way, what we have found that helps prove the validity of the Bible. So Homer's The Odyssey has three copies closest to its original text. The closest copy is 2,000 years after the original. But nobody questions whether Homer wrote those things. Nobody questions if those things were accurate. Caesar's Gallic Wars has 10 copies. And I even confirmed this. Google actually agrees with this. And the closest copy to the original is 900 years after the original was written. But nobody ever questions the validity of this book. In fact, schools write research papers on the Odyssey. I did. I had to in my freshman year. Yet, again, these things, we don't have as many copies as you would think, and nobody questions it. When it comes to the New Testament, we have 5,500 copies. That's quite a bit more, don't you think? And the closest copies we have were written about 100 years after the originals. 100 years? 900 years. 100 years ago, things looked different around here, but they, were, they weren't as different as they were 900 years ago. <laughs> or even 2,000. You see, there was also another discovery that happened when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. This changed the landscape of the Bible forever. When they were discovered, they were taken to see how they compared to the translation of the Bible we have today. They took the book of Isaiah, one particular book, and they compared today's translation and what they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they found that only 17 letters were different. 17 letters. Not words, not phrases, not sentences, but letters. They also discovered that this copy was written in about 100 BC or 100 years before Christ was, do, was born. And it only differs in 17 letters, which also were shown to be minor details. To go a step further, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they took all the other books and they compared it and they found that the majority of the terms were just about almost or identical to what we have today. Well, what does that mean for us? If the, if the things that they discovered were just about almost or identically what we have today, what does that mean for us? It means that we can have confidence that God's word that we hold today in our Bible are the words that God gave us back when he was walking the earth. They're never changing and never failing. Let's go to the chronology real quick. When we look at the Bible and the events of the Bible and how they happen, there are events that are not only affecting the current time, but they also are affecting things in the future. They're confirming things that were earlier stated in the book and even remembered later on in the book. The same holds with the opposite direction. 
things that were written later on confirm the things that were said earlier in the book. And there's prophecy that we're still seeing fulfilled today. It's almost as if all of these events are connected in some way. How does this happen? How does things written over a 1500 year period just magically connect themselves? They don't. The only way this happens is the author of the story knew what was gonna happen at the beginning all the way through the end. The power that an author has of a book is that they can make edits whenever they want, right? They may have the beginning of the book and they may have the end of the book ready in their mind. They write it down. But then they have to make the rest of the book fit to that. God didn't need that. God didn't need to make edits. God didn't have to go in and say, no, take that out. That that doesn't line up with what I said. Because he literally spoke it to the writers of the Bible. There is no edits because there's a divine author who wrote the Bible. Let's look at this real quick. I have this video for you guys. And if you have TikTok or you have Instagram reels, you've probably seen it. But there's a particular image in this video that I want you guys to really focus in on. And so let's let's see what this says. This is a graph that shows the handiwork of God. Now, What you're seeing here is every cross-reference in the Bible that is overt, an overt cross-reference in the Bible. This is every cross-reference in the Bible. In a sense, the Bible, and Jordan Peterson, I love this. He does a whole internet uh, talk on this. Jordan Peterson said, this is the first hyperlinked book 2,000 years before the internet was even created. You got to realize this. God wrote this thing through authors to be hyper. Let me show you how it works. This bar graph down here are all the books of the Bible and chapters. So this right here is Genesis in white. Lighter gray is uh, Exodus. Darker gray is Leviticus. And it goes all the way through to Revelation. Now, the length, because everybody wants to know, what is this guy right here? That's the number Number of verses in in the chapter. And that one, anybody want to take a stab at it? Psalm 119. Now, I don't, I'm not saying this because, believe me, the Bible didn't have chapters and numbers and all that back then, but I find it fascinating. It's almost dead center. Psalm 19 is all about what? The Word. It's all it's about, the Word of God. Okay, so this is the bar graph of the Bible. The length of it is the number of, chapter, or number of verses in the chapter from start to finish. And I want you to see, every one of these lines that connects, the darker the line, the more hyper connections, and it has a rainbow of pictures to show how interconnected the Bible is. Guess how many connections in the Bible? 63,779 connections in the Bible. And every one of these connections points to a theme. If this was the work composed by one man, you're going to love this, we would say this man is a master. What a masterpiece. He's a master composer. The problem is this is written by 40 different men over 1,500 years on three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, in three different languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, and the entire book tells one united story. It's all connected together. The only answer for this is God, period. You find me another book in all of human civilization that even scratches the surface of this. So here's a blown up picture of that particular graph. 63,779 cross references throughout the whole Bible. And we just want to say it's a book written by man. There is so much more to the Bible because it is breathed by God and it is ordained by God. Just soak in that for just a second. Look at that. 63,779 cross references. And yet we still question if the Bible is written by God. This generation that we have 
wants to believe a 15 second clip that somebody just shares about their opinion. And instead of doing the research, because let me tell you real quick, I'm in college right now. Research papers are really hard in college because you have to go find valid cross references. You have to find them and they have to be peer peer reviewed and they have to relate to the topic sentence that you create. Yet God gave us the greatest topic sentence of all time that he loves us and gave us a book where he did all the work. And yet we find it too hard to just believe that God wrote it. We want opinions from others. We're so worried about what others think of us or what might be right or wrong. We're too selfish. Ooh, that's the word. We're too selfish to just give it up and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust that you wrote this, that this is your plan for my life instead of trying to do it on my own. Let's talk about the third spot. Let's talk about prophecy. You want to you wanna talk about things that only God could really fulfill. Let's talk about it. What is prophecy? What is prophecy? Prophecy is the foretelling of the future from the past with ver- in a very accurate way. Let me say it this way. I'll use the same thing I talked about in youth ministry. So if you, if you heard this one, you already know what I'm going to say. I'm not a prophet unless this actually comes to pass. Okay? But if I said in 200 years that a red Toyota Camry was going to crash into our dumpster in the back parking lot and the license plate of that red Toyota Camry was RDV4016 and in 200 years it happens the exact way that I said it would you guys would look at me and go Joseph Pilgrim was a prophet yet the Bible contains 2500 prophecies 2000 of which have been completed 500 yet to come and there's still more being answered every day and yet in a book Science Speaks, a pers- the author of Peter Stoner shows the chances of one man fulfilling eight prophecies. In youth, we talked about this, kind of blew their minds. And uh, so I went and dug a little deeper. And I found probably one of my favorite uh, teachers right now, uh, John Devere, he was talking about this particular subject And he goes into a great detail about the topic of probability. What is probability? If I roll a dice and I want it to roll even, what's the probability of that? 50%, right? One in two, even. There's six numbers. Three of them are even. Three of them are odd. Same thing. If I have 10 balls in a bag and labeled one through 10, if I draw an even number out, it's 50%, one in two. He's going to go into a little bit more detail about what happens with these prophecies, specifically eight of them, and then he'll go into a little bit more detail. About so can we talk about the scripture for a few minutes? 66 books of the Bible written over a 1,500 year time span. Do you understand how long 1,500 years is? If I go back 1,500 years from right now, we're at 515 AD. There hasn't even been a British empire yet. That's a long time ago, okay? 1,500 years, 66 books are written by over 40 writers from three different continents in three different languages. We got kings, we got prisoners, we got soldiers, military men, we got shepherds, we got farmers, we got a physician, we got a tax collector who's a mafia guy. (laughs) And you put all these guys' books together over 1,500 years. Now, many of them lived in different generations and don't know what the other guy wrote. You put them all together and you get a perfectly harmonized book. 
Do you know what that's like? That's like looking at 40 different writers over the last 1,500 years and saying, write a chapter of a novel, putting the whole thing together after 1,500 years and having it make any sense. But not only that, it gets even better. If you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament's 39 books written over 1,100 years. And the last book of the Old Testament is written 400 years before Jesus is even born. I mean, go back 400 years from right now. There's no Atlanta Braves. You don't even have the Falcons yet. You know, that's a long time. The last book was written 400 years before Jesus was even born. Now, you got these 39 books written by all these different authors for over 1,100 years, many of them living in different generations, not knowing what the other guy wrote. And you know what these guys did? They made predictions about the Messiah. Things like he'd ride in Jerusalem on a donkey. He'd be betrayed by a friend. He'd be born in Bethlehem. He'd be called out of Egypt. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. He'd be crucified. And they made over 300 predictions with the last one being made 400 years before Jesus was even born. And do you know Jesus fulfilled all 300 of those predictions? So... There's a scientist named Dr. Peter Stoner who has since gone to heaven, but he was an expert in probability. Do you know what probability is? If I have a five-gallon paint bucket and I have nine white tennis balls and I have one yellow tennis ball and I shake them all up and I blindfold somebody and I say, reach in, grab one ball, the chance of picking out that one yellow tennis ball is one in 10. Well, he's an expert in this. So Dr. Stoner wants to know what is the probability that anybody can fulfill these prophecies? So he doesn't do the work himself. He employs 600 science students from 12 different classes. And they spent years of research. Not years. They spent months of research. The the National American Scientific Council reviewed their work and said not only was their work accurate, but it was conservative. So what I'm about to share with you is conservative. Please remember that. So they said, all right, what are the chances that any human being from any human being in the world from the time of the birth of Christ until the end of the second millennium, 2,000 years, could fulfill just eight of the prophecies? So here's the eight prophecies they chose. Christ, Christ to be born in Bethlehem. That's Micah wrote that. Christ to be preceded by a messenger. Isaiah and Malachi in different generations wrote that. Christ entered Jerusalem on a donkey. Zechariah in a totally different generation wrote that. Christ to be betrayed by a friend. The psalmist in a completely different generation wrote that. And there's the rest of the eight. They took those eight prophecies. Said, what is the chance any human being over 2,000 years could fulfill those eight prophecies? You know what the, after all their calculations, you know what the chances are? One in 10 to the 17th power. Now what in the world is that? 10 to the 17th is a one with 17 zeros behind it. I don't even know how to say that number. And I have an engineering degree. It's not gazillion billion. I got news for you. Okay, but I can illustrate that number. If I have that many silver dollars, I have no place on earth to store them. I have to just spread them out all over the ground. And if I do, if I have that many silver dollars and I spread them out all over the ground, I will cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep with those silver dollars. Now, gather them all in, mark one of the silver dollars. Shuffle them all up, redistribute them all over Texas. Blindfold a guy in Oklahoma, put him in a helicopter. Start flying over Texas. Remember, it takes two days to drive through Texas. At any point, he can say, let down. Then he gets out of the helicopter, still blindfolded. The chances of him picking up that one silver dollar is one in 10 to the 17th power, which means that is the chances that any human being could have fulfilled eight of those prophecies, yet Jesus fulfilled all eight prophecies. So Dr. Stoner said, what about 16 prophecies? So they do all these hours of calculation, he and the 600 science students. And they say that the chances any human being could have fulfilled 16 prophecies is one in 10 to the 45th power. That's a one with 45 zeros behind it. Don't even ask me to write that number down. Now, if I have that many silver dollars, I can't store them on the earth. It's too many. I've got to make a big ball of silver dollars. I've got to make a sphere of them, okay? You know how big this sphere would be? The diameter of that sphere would be 60 times the distance of the earth to the sun. 
If you want mileage, it's 5.5 billion miles. Now, mark one of those silver dollars. Shuffle them all up. Blindfold the guy. Put him in a jet plane. It will take 400 years nonstop flight just to fly around the ball. At any point, he can say let down. Now, remember, he might have to dig 2.75 billion miles into the center because the mark one might be in the center. But the chances of him picking up that one silver dollar is one in 10 to the 45th power. That is the chances that any human being could have fulfilled 16 of the prophecies. Yet Jesus fulfilled all 16. So can I blow your mind? Can I really blow your mind one more time? Can I blow it? So Dr. Stoner said, what about 48 prophecies? What are the chances anybody could fulfill 48 prophecies? So they do hours and hours of calculations. And you know what they found out? It's one in 10 to the 157th power. Now, how big is that number? I can't use the silver dollar. It's too big. I got to go to a smaller item. I got to go to an electron. Now, do you know how small an electron is? Let me just tell you. If you got a one-inch line of electrons, straight line, one inch, and I start counting tonight, and I don't go to sleep, I will count. If I count 250 per minute, it will take me 19 million years to count that one-inch line of electrons. Now, if I have that many electrons... 1 in 10 to the 157th power, i got to make a sphere of electrons. You know how big a sphere would be? It would be as far as man has ever seen into space. 13 billion light years. Now, mark one of those electrons. Blindfold the guy, put him in a space shuttle, send him into space. At any point, he can say, stop. The chances of picking out that one marked electron is the chance that any human being could have fulfilled 48 of those prophecies. Yet Jesus fulfilled all 48. So can we review here? Can we review? Okay, we got, we got 39 books written over 1,100 years by all these guys. Many of them don't even live in the same generation. They make these predictions about the Messiah with the last one being 400 years before he was even born. And Jesus fulfills all 300? And you tell me the Bible doesn't apply to today? You're stupid. One particular prophecy that Jesus was going to be crucified was written before crucifixion was even a thing in the Roman Empire. That makes that prophecy even more crazy because like, what's the probability of that? I don't have the answer for you guys. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies in his lifetime. And that same Jesus was a prophet himself. He made the words that he spoke truth because of his authority, because he was fully God and fully man. Let's look at John 14, 6. John 14, 6 is a well-known passage. We all probably know it. But it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When Jesus makes this statement, he is not just talking to talk, to be heard. Jesus is prophesying that there is no other way to God. That there is no possible way to God except through him. Through a relationship with Jesus. So what does that mean for us today? This is revelation for us that God is who he says he is. The words that we have today are the same words that were given to the prophets, to the major and minor prophets, to the disciples, to those after Jesus when the word was spoken to them, those before Jesus when God was speaking to the writers. It's all relevant to today. Because the Bible itself is a never failing, never changing piece of literature. It has stood the test of time through history and the stories and the prophecies in the Bible point to a creator God. That in all of his sovereignty, sovereignty meaning he knows the beginning from the end, knew where you would be today. That in this moment that he takes care of And he loves you. He loves you so much so that he sent his one and only son 
to die a death on a cross for us so that we, we could live our intended and created way with a relationship with God. It means that we can have faith that the Bible is the word of God. That it is for us, that there is a plan and a purpose for our life. And that the naysayers that come and say, well, that was, that's an old book or anything like that. We can now point to these cross references, these discoveries that were made. The prophecies that are still being fulfilled to this day. Let's think about it this way. Your father just passed away. Wow, that's dark. I know, but stick with me for a second. Your father just passed away. And a couple of years go by and someone tells you that he wrote a book. He wrote a book about how life was and the sacrifices that he made. He shares stories of his kids and how he gave up promotions at work or didn't eat three meals a day so that his children could. He shares how all of these things affected him and his family. But in the end, he shares how much he truly loves his children and his family and that he wouldn't have changed it for anything. Now you get to see my question. How many of us would want to read that book? You see, God wrote us a book. Our heavenly father wrote a book on how much he loves us and how we can honor him. It shares how, much, how we should pray and worship. How we should treat those around us. And it tells us who we are in Christ. My challenge to you today is to find passion in reading God's word. Because it is for you. It was written for you. And it's alive and well and breathes life into us today. No matter the circumstances you're going through, no matter the things that you don't even know are coming in your life. God's speaking to you today. Some of you may think, I don't hear God's voice. Pick up the Bible. Start reading the Gospels. You want to hear what God said? Read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Guess what? They're the account of Jesus' life. The actions that he did while on earth. You know what? You want to know what God says? Jesus says that I only speak what the Father speaks through me. You want to hear from God, go read the Bible. And all I want is to live within your love. Be undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for
seen my office, you'll notice this box sitting between the two chairs in my office. If you don't know what this box is, it's a prayer box. Inside of it, there's note cards where you can write down prayers, keep them on you, and when God answers them, you move them to a different drawer of saying, answer. You see, this box holds this particularly sensitive spot in my heart it's not a box that I just found somewhere it's a box that was given to me by my grandfather on my mom's side and when he gave it to me it wasn't just hey this is yours it was this will be in your office when you are a pastor of a church one day I don't know if he knew he was prophesying. I don't know what he was doing. I was young at the time. I was probably 10. If you don't know, that was 20 years ago. I'm 30. And it came to pass. What are the probabilities of that? First Corinthians chapter two, uh, verse 14 says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to Him. Nor can He know them because they are spiritually discerned. Why do we not understand the Bible? It's because we truly don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Now that sounds harsh. but it's real for us. If I don't understand the word of God, I may need to reevaluate my relationship with him. If the word of God doesn't burn inside of me and I don't wanna hold it in my heart, I may need to reevaluate my relationship with God. I don't want that to be reality for us. So I'm gonna give us an opportunity to truly know the Son of God. I wanna pray for each and every one of us who have a hard time understanding the Word of God. 
when they're reading it they just don't know what it says or it doesn't make sense because each one of us should know the Son of God Father I lift up anybody who struggles with your word whether that's discernment or just flat out reading it every day I pray that you would put a fire and a passion in their heart to know you, to know the plan and purpose that you have on their life. The things that they struggle with, God sees you. He sees where you're at. And he says, I want you to know more about me because Guess what? God created you. I pray that the Word of God would come alive. That as people read the Word, that it would stand off the page and the pictures and the illustrations and the stories would come to life like movies in our brain. And if we don't understand something, Father, that we would ask questions. That we wouldn't just leave it up to, oh, well, I didn't understand that. But we would go find someone. That we would find leadership, find people who have discernment in their life. So God, I pray that we would have that passion, have that desire. And that we would all be filled with your Holy Spirit. The Bible is a divine, is a divine book. It is written by a divine author because he knows the plans and the purpose for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and to give you a future. God doesn't need to make edits. He doesn't need to make edits in the Bible and he doesn't need to make edits in your life. He wants to be in relationship with you. He gave us the book to achieve it. So let's actually make it a habit to read God's word, to read it daily. There are so many plans out there, so many ways that you can get the Bible. Put into your heart, put into your mind, put into your spirit. But we have to make the choice to do it daily so that we can truly know. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only you Jesus, have your way.
Lord, may heaven touch us every time we read your word. In Jesus' name. So let's celebrate God's word and let's celebrate the Holy Spirit's outpouring and let's go get them, tigers. Amen? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go get them, tigers. Hallelujah.